wanted to talk also about why I really feel at this time this is all so important. So, especially this relationship, this intimacy with Mary. So my work as a psychotherapist, as a clinical psychologist, you know, psychotherapy means, psych, psyche means soul, and therapy means healing. It's like a soul, heal, soul healing, in a sense. Um, and so some of the things that I, I've personally learned, too, over, over the, my training and in my work, so our, our earliest, our earliest sense of self, it grows from seeing ourself mirrored in our mother's reactions. And this happens even in the womb, right, where um, there's an interaction already with the mother. And, and psychopathology or mental disorders and all the maladaptive behaviors that come from that, they really result from empathic failures or the lack of mirroring or, attach or attachment. And they block the development of the self or, or cause like fragmenting selves. Um, and so in my work, empathy is really a profound tool. And I've, I've even seen therapy as like being kind of in like a mist, in, in kind of a, a psychological womb, a mystical womb where this person can kind of be like recreated and that reconnect with that, that, that maternal transference. Um, and, and, to, and that empathy really helps develop that process again that's been stunted. And these, these interactions, these empathic interactions, so as we, as we develop our personality and our personality is structured, um, we, we internalize these, these interactions into what's called um, object representations or object relations. So there are these really complex structures or, or, or constructs within our minds and our hearts um, that include you know, thoughts and feelings emotions but even like bodily sensations so just the experience maybe of being rocked by a mother or the the, the picture of the, of the face of a parent who's who's scolding you like all these things have a real profound impact on the development of the self um, and we internalize all them and what's really interesting is that we develop our a, a God image even from them so God is is like the ultimate relationship through which we, we develop our, our most authentic and truest self, but it's really in in the in the in the transferential projective kind of interplay with God, where we we don't always perceive Him as we ought. We kind of project from our from these internalized constructs upon God. You know, you might you might be scrupulous or be anxious because you are afraid of God punishing you, and that's different than seeing God as being merciful. Um, not permissive, but merciful, you know, so our God image is really profound and you know scripture talks about how Our life is hidden with Christ and God um, And even church documents Lumen Gentium. I love this passage talks about how um, that Christ reveals man to himself So it, it's profound to think of, of that relationship with the divine with the sacred as being the ultimate source of our healing wholeness and growth but it's profound too to remember that God image though, and that sense of self, it begins with the mother. And so I really see Mary in all of this, like this, this is kind of heady maybe, but that Mary really is seeking to, to, to heal and restore our image of God, our, our experience of him, our knowledge of him. And I love even that passage in, um, in 2 Corinthians, that we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. And are being transformed into his likeness from one degree of glory to the next. So I really see like that's what Mary wants us to do with unveiled faces to be fully present and to see him, to behold and become what we behold. Um, it's interesting too as, as a child grows, so th this kind of goes into something kind of practical for us. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rosary here. So the rosary, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful tool to kind of connect with Mary, but it's really more than a tool. As an object, it has incredible meaning. So as, as a child a child grows, uh, and as we grow through different stages of our life even, uh, we're confronted by a lot of harsh realities in the world. And for especially for a child, in order to, to confront these realities, you know, hunger, coldness, nakedness, all these, these, these harsh things in the world, we have to develop a sense of self, a strong, whole sense of self, a coherent sense of self, and, and they're often done, that's often done by the use of transitional objects. So we often think about kids with like a teddy bear, like a transitional object. 
But even in, in play, or even as adults, we have activities or behaviors or rituals or all kinds of things that are actually very transitional in nature, in this more psychological language. And these objects, these transitional objects, they're not just something in itself and that's kind of comforting. They actually carry the child's first relational experiences with the mother. So again, you think about the Mary, uh, Mary and the Rosary, right? So it actually brings an awareness of the mother's presence when she's absent. That's profound. And, and I think, you know, as, as most transitional objects, we kind of outgrow them and we don't kind of believe they're lost because we just move beyond it. But with God, with sacred objects, they increase in meaning. They grow, develop and unfold and evolve in meaning. They gain meaning as our beliefs continue to grow and evolve. Um, and I love uh, this one book that, I, that really impacted me. Contemporary Psychoanalysis and Religion, Transference and Transcendence. So in this book, there's this one passage that I wanted to read. Think about this, you know, and this relationship with, with Mary, the rosary, the transitional object, this growing a sense of self, this transformation. So it says that the encounter with the holy continues the, self, the self's fundamental experience of being constituted as a self in the psychological womb of the transforming object. The power of the sacred is, in part, that it carries the potential of recapturing the psyches, or the soul's, moment of creation, and with it the promise of present and future moments of recreation. So again, we see in Mary, but also connecting to Mary and making her presence real through the rosary, uh, not just praying the rosary, but even just holding the rosary and like, holding your mother's hand and you know, pressing her into your heart, just a, a, practicing her presence almost, has power almost to like be born again, born anew, born from above. Um, and so I think that this is, this is uh, powerful in itself too, where the rosary, you know, there's stories of like St. Dominic in, in the book, The Secret of the Rosary. He just put the rosary around the neck of someone who was possessed. And it, it's just, that, you know, I'm going to leave that with you to, to maybe look that up, that story. It's pretty profound. But I, I even had a, had a client who... Um, as an example of some of the, the transformation that she experienced. When she was young, her, her mom was really depressed and severely depressed. And so as a little child, she felt that she had to take care of her mom. Um, but, you know, no child can fully take care of their parents. And it causes what's called parentification. So it, it's like a role reversal. And it causes like this cycle of anxiety in a child's life, Psych anxiety and insecurity. And so she, she came to therapy because her husband was depressed and it was just triggering all this anxiety in her. And so I asked her how she was coping with, with the anxiety and she said that she prays the rosary. And you know I have a picture of, of the Immaculate Heart in my office and, and at one point she just looked up to the, the Immaculate Heart and she began to cry. And she just, and she just cried that this guilt that she just felt like she hasn't been able to, she's failed Mary and even being faithful to the rosary. And I thought that was so profound, and again, this projective transference where, you know, she, there was a real sense in her of failing her mom. She failed to take care of her mom because no child fully can. And she was projecting that on Mary. And so I just took that as an opportunity to allow like this corrective emotional experience for her. And I just invited her to reflect on, you know, how do you, how do you believe Mary wants you to, wants you to see that? How do you think she sees you? And I mean, Mary's kindness, her goodness, her sweetness, her mercy, like that just transforms that narrative that she had been living in. Um, it was just profound. Um, so, you know, one, I, I joked earlier about the idea of marinating. Um, and I think this is something that, um, something that we, you can also practice yourself. You know, Brother Lawrence, he wrote that book, Practice the Presence of God. But in a real way, we can practice the presence of Mary too, not just because of all that embryology stuff and the union of Jesus and Mary, but even in, in Hebrews, you know, it describes being surrounded by a cloud of heavenly witnesses. So we said the angels and the saints in that. I love the, in the Greek uh, lexicon, that word cloud, nephos. I love this, this word, that it's, it's a dense collection of vapor. So if you imagine yourself being surrounded or immersed in a cloud, right? 
you know, even uh, it says in Second Corinthians that the saints are the fragrance of God. So fragrance, vapor, you know, these are things that are breathed in while you're being immersed in a cloud. Like you can't help it. It's just you just breathe it in once you're immersed in it, and and so you almost see like this intimacy with the cloud, this intimacy we have with in the spirit. You know, those who are joined to Christ are one spirit in Him. Um, this intimacy, but especially with Mary, and. You know, I think so often we focus on getting into heaven, but really heaven's getting into us. And Mary, in a real way, I think, kind of makes that a reality. Um, so I wanted to also bring this up too, where um, I think it's important for us to, to begin to, to practice and to steward hearing Mary's voice. I think she's so eager to talk to us. You know, she's found by those who seek her, and she hastens to make herself known to those who desire her as it says in wisdom um, I wanted to read you a passage from Baruch so Baruch chapter 4 verses 9 to 12 and then 17 to 25 so I'm going to read this passage from Baruch and I think it's important because we kind of have to learn how to hear her voice in scripture you know, she's the mother of the word you know, she's in the word and the word's in her um, and so you can kind of hear her voice in this passage especially Our Lady of Sorrows. So if you could just take a moment here, just kind of sit, sit with this and picture Our Lady of Sorrows in this, okay? So this is Mary speaking, her voice in Scripture. God has brought great sorrow upon me, for I have seen the captivity of my sons and daughters, which the everlasting brought upon them. With joy I nurtured them, but I sent them away with weeping and sorrow. Let no one rejoice over me, a widow and bereaved of many. I was left desolate because of the sins of my children, because they turned away from the law of God. But I, how can I help you? For he who brought these calamities upon you will deliver you from the hand of your enemies. But go, my children, go, for I have been left desolate I have taken off the robe of peace and put on the sackcloth of my supplication. I will cry to the everlasting all my days. Take courage, my children, cry to God, and he will deliver you from the power and hand of the enemy. For I have put my hope in the everlasting to save you. And joy has come to me from the Holy One because of the mercy which soon will come to you from your everlasting Savior. For I sent you out with sorrow and weeping, but God will give you back to me with joy and gladness forever. It's amazing in that passage you see the Trinitarian language too, the everlasting, the Holy One, the Savior. But you also just hear, and, and, and I pray that you can really connect and feel that, how she awaits your homecoming. You know, um, there's such desire and longing for when God gives, gives for those who the Father calls um, to give us back to her in a sense um, and uh, that passage it almost reminds me of like Our Lady of Medjugorje or different saints who have had like locutions of Mary or something um, so I think it's important just to be able to hear even the spirit of her voice um, and so this is, I know this I'm already almost coming to an hour of, of my time here um, I was given a little bit of extra time, partly because I'm long-winded, um, but this is really important in information too, I think, that I, I wanted to share with you. And so this next part here, um, we often think about marrying devotion as a lot of these pious acts that we do for Mary, and ways that we show our love for her and, and kind of cultivate and practice a virtue and, and a mindfulness, cultivate a, a mindfulness of Mary. Um, but it's really like an exercise of the will and, and habit. Um, but there's some mystics. So one of my favorite, favorite, favorite books is this book by Father Emile Nubert, this French priest, called Life of Union with Mary. I highly recommend it. It's practical and profound. Uh, and there's some passages in it that I wanted to read to you. So rather than just focusing on like Mary and devotion, you know, we had that from the embryology, this profound connection with Mary that, that God has and, and Mary has with God. So to even to think about 
mystical union, right? So, um, and that there's, to even think about the, the presence of Mary, the, the gift of her presence. So some passages from this book here. So, in order to speak of the Blessed Virgin and to live in union with her, it is necessary to feel that in some way we are in her presence. Physical presence requires nearness and space. In the moral order, however, or the spiritual, presence involves rather the possibility of direct interaction between persons. We feel that we are in the presence of a person when we are aware that they see us, hear us, notice our conditions, and are able to reply to us and act upon us. The more complete these conditions are realized, the more completely there's a realization of presence. And he goes on to say how Mary, though, you know, again, all that embryology stuff, Mary is present to us in still another way, by a, by a direct physical presence. The opinion of most theologians, and of Thomists in particular, is that the glorified humanity of Jesus exercises a physical action upon us. Now, according to the principle of analogy between the privileges of Jesus and those of Mary, all these, act all these activities exercised by the humanity of Jesus, which are not required by the hypostatic union, are shared with Mary, in as far as they are benefiting Mary as a, as a per pure creature and, and a woman. We may expect, then, that the glorified humanity of Mary exercises an analogous physical action upon us. Like, that's, that's some, <laughs> some heavy stuff, but... And I, and I think it's important to kind of offer this kind of clause here. That when we talk about mystical union with Mary, then, and her, and her presence, it's different than mystical union with Jesus. Um, that God... You know, we're, we're partakers of the divine nature, as Scripture says. He dwells in us in a unique way. You know, Jesus resides and acts in us. Mary acts in us, but she doesn't reside in the same way in us. So, we see that in a lot of the mystical theology of the Church, Teresa of Avila, for instance, that it talks about this process of transforming union, where this growing consciousness of God's presence, and even a and a lived and real experience of participating in God and His presence. It begins with what's called like a spiritual espousal and is consummated in spiritual marriage. But a lot of the, the Marian mystics uh, that are in that book, even St. John Hughes that I mentioned earlier, they really started with this espousal relationship with Mary that's led into this profound union. And so, um, like Marian union, for instance, like it consists then in, in a real conscious awareness of her presence and her activity within us, where she imparts, um, like, uh, or infuses even her dispositions within our, within our souls, within our hearts, to help us be closer to God, um, and that there's an awareness of her activity within us, and, and it can be to a you know a more or less intense way where. You know, on one extreme, we can be overpowered to the point of the soul itself feeling, as it were, possessed by Mary, identifying with her, and, and it feels as if, like, she is the, the soul of the soul. And, you know, it's interesting, even, so in my Bible here, I have uh, taped into my Bible this, this prayer uh, by Pope John Paul II. So Pope John, John Paul II, it's this is a prayer called Totally Yours, and just a side note too. I was at the Anima Christi, but there's also an Anima Mariae prayer that we can, we can pray, but, but anyways, Pope John Paul II said this prayer called Totally Yours. Immaculate Conception, Mary, my mother, live in me, act in me, speak in and through me, think your thoughts in my mind, love through my heart, give me your dispositions and feelings. Teach, lead, and guide me to Jesus. Correct, enlighten, and expand my thoughts and behavior. Possess my soul. Take over my entire personality and life. And replace it with yourself. Incline me to constant adoration and thanksgiving. Pray in me and through me. 
Let me live in you and keep me in this union always. <laughs> Profound. Um, and I wanted to give you another example of, of so from the book, what this really would look like in a, in, in a soul. So we have this mystical union with Jesus, this mystical union, uh, the embryology, this, this transferential self stuff, the presence of Mary. This is what it could look like. And this is kind of, as, as you're entering into greater devotion for Mary, that to have this kind of ahead of you, this, this longing, and to even ask the Holy Spirit for the gift of her presence. Um, not to so much seek like a spiritual experience, but just that we have this desire for intimacy and, and for our mother, um, which I think is a psychological need and, and totally okay to ask the Holy Spirit for. Um, we need it. So there's this passage where this mystic describes what she experiences. So the spirit of Jesus, Jesus seemed to direct and be the life of my soul, which for a time seems possess, seemed possessed by him. This is like that mystical marriage. But then the Spirit of Jesus accomplishes all things through me, and under his guidance and action, I seem to be carried along, almost passive. I was conscious of the life of Jesus in me, and, and it was manifested in me. And she says, But today, almost in the same manner, the Spirit of Mary seems to live in me, to command the movements made by the powers of the soul, to set them in motion, and to impel them to act or not to act, so that they may live in God in a new way not yet experienced until today. Thus, Mary appears as our life, or as a warm atmosphere giving life, in which and through which we breathe in God in a higher and nobler way than before. The maternal love and the favors of this sweet mother manifest themselves with such brilliance and such evidence that there cannot be the least uncertainty or the least suspicion of illusion or any mixture of sentiments of the natural order. She has taken me under her motherly guidance and direction. As a teacher guides the hand of a child in teaching it to write, while writing, the child does not move its hand unless the teacher directs and guides it. And the child lets itself be moved and guided by the hand of the teacher. That's that's profound. Um, and as another example too of, of, of even the experience, not just in action and in being, but but even the awareness in prayer and in, in contemplative prayer. So she says that the mind the mind turns toward God. You know, in prayer, right? The mind turns toward God and rests in his being, without any, any images even, just rests in his being. And through a pure adherence to contemplation of and fruition in that simple, absolute being, it happens that my soul experiences, besides all that, a kind of repose or a resting or abiding, an adherence to a contemplation of and a fruition in Mary, insofar as she is one with God and united to Him. Tasting God, I taste Mary also, as if she were one with God and not distinct from Him. Of course, she's not God, she's a creature, and infinitely less. But, but, but still, so much so that God and Mary seem to be the only one object for the soul. It is, it is almost like the holy humanity of Christ, which we contemplate, united to the divinity, making of these two natures only one person, that, like Mary and God, are almost like one sole object of contemplation. So that's some pretty intense stuff. Um, but, you know, as I, as I described before marinating, it wasn't just like this discipline, this exercise that I was doing practicing her presence. There were times, honestly, where I was flooded, flooded with her presence, or fr flooded with the sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit, so much so that there were times where I was like, you know, as we would say in the charismatic movement, slain in the Spirit, resting in the Spirit, unable to move, uh, you know, off my, my prayer chair. Like, I was just soaked in, in presence. Um, 
and I'll, I'll be honest, there was a couple of times where I actually heard her audible voice. Um, and it was always the same thing. It was, you know, there was just a moment of this intense stillness and rest. And then I would hear her say, Sean. <laughs> she just said my name, just Sean. But it was like Mary when she greeted Elizabeth and, and the child in her womb leaped. I felt it was like a shot of adrenaline in my arm. Like my whole soul and being was just filled with joy and excitement and exuberation. I just was like, Phew! like lit up, filled. Each time she said that, it just had this profound effect. And there were times even where suddenly I would just start getting this fragrance of just roses everywhere. I could be in a strange place even within the stink. And I would just smell roses. It was just resting in her. It was profound. Um, so, okay. I want to talk about one last thing before kind of ending here. I know this is a... I really hope that the, that the Holy Spirit through Mary has given you like a supernatural capacity to just receive this this download and, and uh, of information. So... I wanted to talk in a practical way now about Mary and her role in the church today, especially, of course, with evangelization. So we're in a time right now where there's a lot of emphasis on new evangelization, and we're really rediscovering the role of the Holy Spirit in evangelization. It's interesting, too, to see in, in the Marian apparitions. Like I love, there's a, there's a book by the St. Paul Street Evangelization uh, Group um, called, I think it's, Ordinary signs, extraordinary, ordinary people, extraordinary signs, something like that. But there's a pr uh, the pr the intro or the preface of the book is actually written by Archbishop Bishop, and he talks about how Mary in the apparitions, she models what evangelization should look like to us. And you know, I think often we, we can it's easy enough for us to think, oh, that's Mary, but I think it's also our, our model, you know. That whenever the gospel is preached, whenever the word is proclaimed, signs and wonders accompany it. All the apparition sites, there's there's healings and miracles that are, and prophetic words and, and you know are given. Um, you know, even Saint Paul says that you know I come not with wor with words wise words that your faith may rest in the words of men, but with demonstrations of the Spirit and power that your faith may rest in God. Um, you know, we want to impart faith, a kind of faith to people where you're not convinced into it, where you could be convinced out of it. <laughs> you know, like Jesus appearing to the disciples in this time before Pentecost, he gave them convincing proofs of his presence and spoke of the, of the kingdom. So, I was at a conference recently, and uh, Encounter Ministries conference, and I had a dream one night of this, of this saintly prophetic man. Um, his name was actually Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> Uh, really, really profound stories in this man's life, but I saw him kind of taking on and off like this lanyard, like a conference lanyard, but it had like premium access on it, and it was red, and, uh, and as I was interpreting the dream, it was like this anointing or this mantle that he was kind of almost wanting me to take from him. And as I was praying to that the next day, in one of these deep moments of prayer, I experienced Mary coming to me, and like, you know, when I experienced her, like sometimes she's just so sweet and kind and like, gentle and um, just oh yeah lose you but I saw her wanting to offer her mantle to me as well and it and so often we pray for Mary's mantle to be a, a mantle of protection we pray for her mantle of protection to be on us but she also has a couple other mantles that I think that are important to kind of capture here uh, she has a mantle of praise you know so I mean, let me backtrack a second even just the thought of what a mantle is, right? Mantles are, are worn by prophets. Elijah had a mantle, and, and when he was taken up to heaven, the mantle fell onto Elisha, was passed on to him, and, and the sign was, you know, if you see him going up to heaven, then the double portion would fall on Elisha. And, and even using the mantle as that object or the tool of doing miracles, like hitting the water and making it split. There's twice as many miracles in Elisha's life, Elisha's life, um, a double portion of, in his mantle. Jesus, when he ascends to heaven, you know, we receive the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, you know, some days later. Again, it's like this, this mantle being passed. Jesus commissions us, as the Father sent me, you know, I'm sending you. But Mary also 
was assumed into heaven. And so I really believe that there's, there's a gift of her mantle that we kind of need to discover. And I really think that this mantle, it's really a praise and the prophetic. Um, it says in Isaiah 61, verse 3, that those who, who were mourn in Zion, so me in Zion, in Mary, are given a mantle of praise and a, an oil of gladness, like this anointing of the Spirit. But especially with, with, with a prophecy, um, so it's interesting, again, prophecy and praise. In my Bible, on the footnote to uh, Isaiah, Isaiah is the beginning of the books of the prophets. It's this awesome passage here. It says, But there were similar groups of prophets who spoke in the name of Yahweh. These prophets experienced ecstasies and trances, often induced by the playing of music, and, and seemed to have been organized into communities. You almost get a picture of like, you know, charismatic prayer groups that, that Israel had hundreds and hundreds of prophets organizing these groups. And it's kind of profound though to think of like that they would often go, go into ecstasies or, or trances induced by the playing of music. Trances are is language that we probably aren't very comfortable with because of New Age stuff. But I mean, Paul or, or Peter in Acts ten ten, you know, he went into a trance just waiting for lunch one day. You know, and, and but it also led to the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit. So I think we kind of need to reclaim that for ourselves too, but I digress. Um, but it's interesting, when I mentioned even in the Book of Wisdom earlier, it says that wisdom, you know, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of gods and prophets. And we see that Mary, um, Mary, you know, she, 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 a prophet's one who hears the word of the Lord, but she tells us to do everything he tells you at the wedding feast of Cana. So you almost see how she's priming our hearts to anticipate that he's going to say something for us to do what he tells us. So she almost like prepares us to hear. She, she awakens and, and guides and helps initiate uh, pr the prophetic within us. And it's interesting also, uh, the book of Revelation, it says that the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We've already seen how, how Mary's whole being testifies of Jesus and she's already so one with the spirit the spirit prophets you too um, Thomas Aquinas you know he describes prophecy as, as as when this kind of prophetic light a light dawns on the soul by a kind of impression that enlightens the mind in Song of Songs 610 Mary is described as like you know, who is this who appears like the dawn Mary is literally like the dawn that precedes that light comes from God, that, that it comes from prophecy. And some other, some other passages too that I, I found this profound union of Mary and prophecy. So it says in 1 Corinthians 14 that if an unbeliever were to come into a room you know, where everyone's prophesying, they're called to account, convicted, and it says that the secrets of their heart will be revealed. In the New King James it says at least, or laid bare, right? And prophet Simeon, filled with the Spirit, prophesies over Mary that a sword shall pierce her heart, that the secret thoughts of many may be revealed. So it's kind of uh, this parallel. Um, but even so, even a couple other things. In the Book of Wisdom, again, this is profound. Think about Mary and the Holy Spirit in her role in the prophetic. I said before that you know she meets us in every thought. Um, like her, even her pre being filled with grace, prevenient grace, which exposes us and, and opens us even to receive grace and receive the gifts of the Spirit, She's, she is the one that imparts to us even that grace. So she meets us in every thought. She's an initiator in the knowledge of God and an associate in his works, says in Wisdom 8.4 and uh, Wisdom 8.8. 8. If anyone longs for wide experience, she knows the things of old, infers the things to come. She understands turns of speech and the solution of riddles. She has foreknowledge of signs and wonders. And the outcome of seasons and times. So, you know, even at Wedding Feast of Cana, Mary knew that Jesus was going to do something. She had like this, this words of wisdom, word of knowledge, forth telling, foretelling, discernment, understanding, all of this. And it's interesting too, you know, Paul describes, even with the charismatic gifts, we're called to seek them eagerly, uh, especially prophecy. But, you know, it says with wisdom again, in Wisdom 6.20, the desire of wisdom leads to a kingdom. And then Wisdom 10.10, 10, that wisdom shows the kingdom of God and, and gives knowledge of angels. 
um, it's profound that you know even the charismatic renewal it was really birthed in well part of part of the history was that in 1901 January 1st 1901 Pope Leo the 13th he prayed to the Holy Spirit saying the Venice Creator Spirit to us by that Holy Spirit window in St. Peter's 1901 January 1st on that same day in Topeka Kansas the Holy Spirit fell on a group of Protestants who were praying to the Holy Spirit and they received the gift of tongues and a lot of people believe that that's the beginning that was the, really the beginning of the Pentecostal movement but what I think is profound is that happened on the feast which is actually my birthday as well January 1st my birthday it's the feast of Mary mother of God and so I really just see this profound connection between Mary and the moves of the Spirit and, and even in our time you know, there's a lot of prophetic words that have been given recently about this wave of the Spirit coming. Um, and I think this is important to kind of grasp too. You know, it says in Ephesians that the household of God is it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. I had an image when praying into this that, you know, I think we have the apostolic down. You know, um, we have the, the hierarchy and the institutional part of the church down, but not so much the prophetic anymore. Um, so I saw, like, you know, if it builds a house, the apostles and prophets, I had this image of a lean-to. Like a lean-to is just one, one side of a roof, but it's exposed to what's on the outside. It's exposed. But with the apostles and prophets, I almost see, like, this solid roof that's there's, it's a safe refuge, and there's not that same exposure. And without the prophetic, then we can't even, like, build the, the structure of the church well. It says in uh, Psalms 127, which is a song of ascent, so going up to God, like that kind of going up to the pr prophetic, hearing Him, connecting with Him. But unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And I think that's something for us to kind of meditate with, where, you know, Mary um, says in the Catechism 773 that the Marian dimension of the church actually precedes the Petrine. This, this kind of more prophetic, charismatic, pneumatological part of the church, dimension of the church. Um, but we see even that interplay between the two dimensions at, at the wedding feast of Cana, you know, Mary's with the apostles, at the cross, Mary's with John, but also at Pentecost. You know, Mary, Mary is at the cross, in the upper room with the apostles, and she's, the church, the church teaches that she really helped prepare the community of believers to, to be disposed to the coming of the Spirit. She helps position us and, and postures us to, to be open to the Lord, to receive the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, so I really feel like in our time, as we're kind of seeking to rediscover that just, just the, the, the prophetic, um, that Mary is going to be really important to help posture and position us to receive the Holy Spirit. And as we're preparing for Pentecost, I just want to close then with one last song. Uh, it's a song that I wrote, um, really, it was really inspired it's called Overshadow Me. And you can already hear, like, you know, what I've shared today, just how Marian that even is. But I just invite, you know, as we're preparing for Pentecost in this time, and, and I think it's really timely that we're having this conference, that we pray that Mary may help posture and position us rightly before the Lord to receive the Holy Spirit, that she may transform us, you know, by the Holy Spirit um, to be more like her son. So... And I just realized, like, you know, we've fallen short so much of all of this, so we can kind of just put ourselves in a posture of, of even uh, just starting with kind of these places, just really placing ourselves before Mary, before the Holy Spirit. We're going to just pray to the Holy Spirit with Mary here. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Just posture ourselves before Him.
like fire from above can rest on me. Take from me this heart of stone, let it be for you alone. Reach out your hand to sign wonders. Yeah.
like fire from above and rest on.